Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Matchett and we'll be covering prohibition in the state of Arkansas. As the United States entered the 20th century, years of temperance activism and anti-drink rhetoric began to increase throughout the nation. This became more prominent with the onslaught of World War I. As the government began to need to pull out of grain storages to support the war effort, taking the resource from the liquor businesses. After World War I's end, this anti-drink movement became a national discussion, leading to widespread prohibition across the nation. This obviously would affect Arkansas, where many temperance supporters stated fears that Arkansas's economic growth would be inhibited due to Arkansas's association with alcohol and reputation as a wild frontier. As the temperance movement grew in the years leading up to the 18th Amendment, the official establishment of prohibition, temperance leaders found strength in recruiting minority groups, primarily African-American and female Arkansans. In the age of prohibition, African-Americans and women would not only further the temperance movement in Arkansas, but also seize the opportunity to exercise political activism publicly for the first time. The African-American community's effect on the temperance movement in Arkansas cannot be understated. While not the most prominent group, we'll get to them later, African-Americans were instrumental in the push for prohibition in our state. Despite the community's large impact, they were actually slow to join the temperance movement. For much of temperance's history, the main drivers both for and against have been white Americans. African Americans were marginally ignored from partaking in either movements and were relatively banned from drinking establishments altogether. This neglect would lead to a reluctance among the African American community to join the temperance movement, leading to overt racism from white temperances. A great example of the exclusion of African Americans was in 1913, when the Arkansas General Assembly came together and announced that all liquor retailers were to provide a petition consisting of white signatures in order to be granted a license for business. Prohibitionists, seeing their general lack of progress, would later revert their standing on black involvement and reach out to prominent black leaders. These prominent figures were Scipio Jones, known for guiding the appeals of the 12 black men condemned to death after the Elaine race riots, Reverend Joseph A. Booker, who was president of the Arkansas Baptist College, and Bishop James M. Connor of the American Methodist Episcopal Church. This plea for help from white prohibitionists would be answered, as these prominent black leaders would urge their communities to vote in favor of prohibition, even preaching sermons in churches about the importance of temperance. Those who possess voting rights amongst the black community would do so. The involvement of African Americans in the temperance movement would prove a fruitful endeavor, as in 1915, Arkansas would pass the Newberry Act, causing the state to go dry statewide. Not stopping while they were ahead, prohibitionists would continue to push anti-drink rhetoric, and in 1917, Arkansas passed the Arkansas State Liquor Law of 1917, which would outlaw the, quote, transportation, delivery, and storage of liquor, only making exceptions for alcohol to be used in, quote, scientific, religious, and medical purposes. The United States Congress would later pass the 18th Amendment, making the sale of alcohol illegal in the states, which would be ratified by the Arkansas government in the year 1919. Though now considered illegal, the selling of liquor would continue throughout the state, as would black involvement in the temperance movement. This continued support from African Americans would be extremely significant, not just because they helped pass laws in favor of prohibition, but because this was one of the first times in Arkansas history that African Americans would have a major intentional influence on Arkansas politics. The other leading minority group were Arkansas women, who would also prove essential and effective in the fight for prohibition in Arkansas. Similarly to black Arkansans, women were not the first to push for temperance. However, unlike the black community, they were quick to join the temperance movement. Many would argue, in fact, that women would become the heart of the Arkansas Prohibitionist Movement. The leading women's organization in the fight for statewide prohibition here in Arkansas was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU. This organization was founded years before the subject of prohibition became such a hot topic in the year of 1873 in Hillsboro, Ohio, 
The WCTU was actually a nationwide movement and found many women who were eager to join the cause here in Arkansas. In 1879, WCTU members were urged by the Forest City Union to gather in Searcy, Arkansas, around the same time that the all-male Arkansas State Christian Temperance Union was holding their convention. Meeting in a Searcy Baptist church, the women present would elect Annie T. Jones as the president of the new Arkansas WCTU. So I decided to take this on my phone. Uh, I just thought it'd be a lot easier to take it on here. The mic is pretty good. Uh, and then to add it into the rest of the video later. Um, so this for this small section of the video, it's, it's a little different. Um, but here, as you see on my screen, this is the First Baptist Church in Searcy, Arkansas. Um, as I just discussed, this is where the Arkansas WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, uh, met separately from the male temperance leaders in order to kind of elect their own president uh, for the Arkansas chapter. So this is what it looks like on the outside. Um, here's a, another picture of a main area. It, clearly there's tons of room here to kind of convene and meet. Um, and here's another picture. There is a third picture but there's a lot of kids in that, and uh, obviously I don't have their permission, and their faces aren't blurred, so we're going to skip that one. Um, but yeah, this is what the church looks like on the outside. It's very old-timey. Screams, screams early 20th century, in my opinion, minus the, the new cars here and there. Um, but yeah, it was at this church in Searcy, Arkansas, where uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union would elect Annie T. Jones as their president of the Arkansas chapter. Soon after, the WCTU would begin to work closely with African Americans, urging the importance of temperance among the black community. Unlike the other southern states, however, the Arkansas WCTU would not establish an African American union during this time in the late 19th century. By 1906, around 60% of the towns in the United States had banned saloons and taverns, and Arkansas marched right alongside many of these states. By the same year, 53 out of the 75 counties in Arkansas had voted dry in their biannual local option elections. Soon, after the clashing of Methodist and Baptist temperance leaders, the male temperance movement would, begin, would split into separate rival factions. Because of this, it was imperative that the WCTU, and soon the African American community, remain strong and continue to support and fight for the Arkansas temperance movement. The WCTU would continue to push for prohibition in Arkansas and would be instrumental, along with the black community, in the passing of the Arkansas Liquor Law of 1913, the Newberry Act of 1915, and the passing of the Bone Dry Law of 1917. In August of 1920, the 19th Amendment would be passed, giving women the right to vote. This would only increase the level of political involvement and power that women would have in the state. Other prominent women of the WCTU would arise throughout this time in Arkansas. Carrie Nation, known for her hatchet-wielding destruction of kegs and saloons, would become an important leading figure for women in the Arkansas Prohibitionist movement, traveling the state similarly to Annie T. Jones, whose pro-temperance message was generally well received. Carrie Nation would eventually settle in Eureka Springs, where she would live out the rest of her days. Here's some comics that I found online of Carrie Nation. Uh, I thought they were pretty funny. It showed that uh, Carrie Nation had a much more aggressive uh, way of pushing uh, for temperance. Um, here it says, The Saloon Smasher on the Warpath. And the next comic shows Carrie Nation leading pro temperanceists, uh, members of the WCTU, saying that we are doing God's will and soldiers of Jesus, as it shows on the flag in the top right. And it seems they're opposing a bartender, which I think is funny, is that along these uh, similar, must be Bibles, uh, books in front of him, it has a multitude of quotes from the Bible talking of, you know, giving drink, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, wine which cheereth God. Um, it's qu clearly quotes from the Bible, and yet it is the opposition of that who is saying they're doing God's will. Uh, I thought that was uh, pretty, pretty comedic. Jenny Carr Pittman, another temperance activist, 
would also travel near and far and urge women to support the movement, continuing to do so into the 1920s and 30s, years after the 18th Amendment had already been passed. Overall, prohibition in Arkansas would prove to be extremely significant for women. The movement and the establishment of the Arkansas WCTU gave Arkansas women an outlet to engage in politics for the first time in a public forum. This era, along with the passing of the 19th Amendment, would be major steps forward for women's rights not only here in Arkansas, but nationwide. Despite the positive impacts of prohibition on African Americans and women in the state and nationwide, prohibition, as you could most likely guess, would ultimately fail in the United States. With the Great Depression causing a dramatic drop in tax revenue nationwide, many state governments considered the repealing of the 18th Amendment. Reasons being that it could create a new revenue source, with taxes coming from both the sale of alcohol and the materials used in production. This would, in turn, help both farmers, the working class, and industries involved in the manufacture of liquor goods. Many considered that prohibition, while a noble cause, was much worse than what alcohol could possibly create. Many also pointed out that alcohol had continued to be bought and sold illegally for all the years that prohibition was in place. Throughout the South, moonshiners crafted their brew in secret in the backwoods. Speakeasies and secret saloons were established all across the nation. The resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan also occurred as they sought to rid the states of bootleggers and saloons. On top of all this, nationwide prohibition had also given rise to organized crime, especially in major cities with ports, who found the business of alcohol to be a promising investment for their growing empires. With all these factors and the desperate need to create revenue after the Great Depression, it was only a matter of time before prohibition was repealed. In 1933, the 21st Amendment was passed by the United States government. For about two more years, Arkansas would remain a mostly dry state until 1935. Facing deficits due to the Great Depression, the Arkansas General Assembly would finally adopt the 21st Amendment and allow for the manufacture and sale of all alcoholic goods with the passing of the Thorn Liquor Law, making all counties wet by default. After this point, prohibition would become a county-by-county -county issue in the state of Arkansas, with elections being held by the county to decide whether it could be considered wet or dry. Prohibitionists would continue to push for statewide prohibition, as seen in November of 1950. Shortly before November 7th of that year, the election day of that year, hundreds of temperate supporters would gather here steps of the state capitol to listen to clergy members preach the importance of a temperance lifestyle as white choir members of the Washita Baptist University chanted vote drive. Here is a picture of then Governor Sid McMath who you may actually recognize from an earlier lecture in Dr. Foster's class concerning the 1950s politics in the state. Then Governor Sid McMath when asked about the proposal said, quote, we tried prohibition once and everyone saw what happened. While black involvement in temperance would remain for a time, the community would soon switch their focus on more important issues such as civil rights. Uh, and speaking of civil rights in Arkansas, here is a picture of the Little Rock Nine who you may also remember from Dr. Foster's lecture on the Little Rock crisis. The WCTU would remain proponents of prohibition until the 1980s with their disbandment. The revenue and tourism brought on by alcohol in the state was simply too much for prohibitionists to take on. And to this day, the fight is still raging county by county, with 33 out of the 75 counties being dry. Arkansas prohibition would not have been possible without the involvement of African Americans and women in the state. Because of their support, the pro-temperance movement was able to continue to effectively campaign amongst the population and make significant changes to state laws. Though ultimately a failure, prohibition would create significant opportunities for African Americans and women Arkansans to intentionally exercise political activism in a public forum for the first time in the state's history. I of course need to give thanks to several sources that I used in the making of this video. Special thanks to Encyclopedia of Arkansas, 
alcoholproblemsandsolutions.org, and Frenowiki from UCA Honors. While I use several other sources in the crafting process, these three were the main contributors to my research, and for that, they are given special attention.